<laughs> Gotta love technology. <laughs> when, it works. when it works, yes. Something I use every day when I talk to people. <laughs> so we are good to go now. Uh, should be live. Yes, Diane? Yep. Yeah? All right. But with that, uh, today we continue with uh, our sermon series. Can you believe we're almost done with our Latin series? We have today, and, and I hear echo. Um, today, uh, we'll be having I Am Thirsty, which is the next to last one. Next week, we will finish up, and then it'll be Holy Week, where we'll start off. But this Wednesday night, we will continue our Bible study going deeper in today's sermon, I Am Thirsty. And so we invite you to join us at 7 o'clock right here on Wednesday evening for that. Next Saturday, our busyness continues. This is a busy month. Uh, this Saturday, the 16th, we'll be showing the movie Finding Normal. Uh, for those of you watching online, the playlist that's out there does have it after the music, so you can watch the trailer for it if you haven't seen it and see what the movie is about. And we just invite you to join us for that it's a free movie, free concessions while they last. So, you come late and they're gone. That's never happened, though. Well, that's never happened. I, I keep no. thinking of Jesus feeding the 4,000 to 5,000, and it just, it just keeps happening. So, uh, likelihood is we won't run out, but we do invite you to join us for that. Uh, movie is at 6 o'clock. And then, coming up very quickly on the 24th, which is Palm Sunday, we start uh, Holy Week. And so we'll have our Palm Sunday service uh, on the 24th. On Friday the 29th, uh, we will continue having uh, Holy Week with our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. And then on Sunday the 31st, we will celebrate Easter Sunday worship with a resurrection service at 10 a.m. So we do invite you to join us for that week, a very important week in the life of the church. Then the following, right after Easter, we go, we just keep going. Uh, men's breakfast, uh, this past month we didn't have it, so I know some of the guys missed out on it. We've already heard uh, Doug wants to take the bacon and he wants to pour the batter over it from the pancakes, oh. make pancake covered bacon. And I'm thinking that's all we need. You got bacon, no. you got pancakes. Oh, uh, Danny says we have time biscuits and gravy. Biscuits and gravy. There are priorities. So, uh, great time of, of food and fellowship with other men here at the church. So, we invite you to join us for that on the 6th at 9 a.m. And then the following weekend after that, we will have our April 13th races for Orange Track Racing and uh, do invite you to join us for that. This Yesterday we had the March races and we had three new racers with us. So uh, it's just been great uh, as this season has seen some growth in it. For those of you who are watching like online, as I alluded to a little bit ago, the link to the uh, worship music will be uh, in the comments. If it doesn't work for you or what have you, put a shout out there. We can message it to you privately so that you have it. With that, that is all the announcements we have. We're going to slow down after that, and we're just going to uh, go to God this morning. Father God, we just thank you for the day that you've given us. It is a beautiful day outside. The weather is wonderful, Father. There's rain in our forecast, which we so desperately need, and we just thank you that you take care of us. Father, help us to hear the words that you have for us this morning, the lesson that you have for us this morning. And may it be not just words that we hear, but that we are truly able to listen to those words, Father, and use those words to put into our daily lives so that when we go out of this place, people see you through us, through our actions and through our words, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Mark 14, verses 35 and 36. This is from the New King James Version. It says, he went a little farther and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour I passed from him, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. It's hard to imagine what Jesus was experiencing at that point. 
it's been depicted and shown and, and that he was in such distress that he actually sweat blood. He was praying. He's well aware of the cost of the Father's will. He knew what suffering was to come. And from a human standpoint, I can imagine he didn't want to endure it. No one wants to endure physical pain. Whether it's a sore shoulder, a, a knee, being ill, we don't want to feel those things. But this is a much different pain. This, he is doing the Father's will. And it's this statement of take this cup away from me that this part resonated the most with me from this passage. The cup is symbolic of the wrath of God. If we look at the Old Testament, any time that the cup is mentioned, it's because of God's wrath. And he would be, this would be poured out on the sinners to make them righteous. Drinking cups were mentioned throughout as symbols of that judgment. And Jesus would figuratively, figuratively drink from that cup meant he was going to take God's suffering on behalf of all of us. All that sin. And I can't speak for anyone. I know what my sins have been. And there's been a lot. We're not immune to it. And he's taking that on for all of us. He willingly goes to the cross for our sake. In this time of trial, Jesus entrusted himself into the hands of his Father, and he would intentionally, voluntarily, and obediently endure the cross, despising all shame. That tells me that anything worth having will cost something, and having eternal life is priceless. As we get ready to hear the message that the Lord has given to Mark this morning, I leave you with this question. What does your commitment to God cost you? What has it cost you? Father, we just thank you for this message that you've given to Mark this morning. And we ask again that you would allow us to hear this message, that it would resonate. That we would see and understand a little bit better what Jesus went through, what you had your son go through just for us. Father, we thank you and praise you and your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good, morning. good morning. Everybody's all here with bright, cheery looks on their faces and everything. Sun shining outside. It's a balmy 27 degrees. <laughs> we should still be in bed. Well, you know, we kind of lost a little bit of sleep yesterday, so I, I, I couldn't help myself. I posted up a Star Trek meme about that yesterday, and so go up to the Facebook site and see it. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, you, you just kind of, it, it just seems worse. It's only an hour. I lay awake more than that most nights anyway, but you know, it just seems like that when the that alarm clock went off this morning, it was just like, no, not yet, no, no. <laughs> Roll over. I couldn't, the dog was there. Uh, but you know, this still is a day. Every day that we get up, we should rejoice. We have another day of life, another day in the presence of Almighty God. And if we think about it that way, it's a privilege to wake up every morning, no matter what time it is, no matter what time it is. Well, as we go through our sermon series here from Seven Words, today is Jesus said the words, I am thirsty from the cross. And immediately when I first started thinking about this, when I went to write the sermon this morning, 
Um, I was thinking about when I was uh, a teenager working on the farm, baling hay out there in the sun in Missouri, and you know, there was like no shade anywhere. Uh, we were very lucky because we had seven ponds on our farm down there. So if you got really, really bad, you go jump in the pond for a minute or two and then come out. Of course, you're all muddy then. But, uh, so what we would do is we would take these half-gallon milk jugs, plastic milk jugs, we'd fill them up with water, and of course down there it's all well water, so it's, you know, that's the best water you can ever get. And we would freeze them and take them out there and so we'd have like three or four of those out there as we're bucking bales. And this is before we got the nice big round balers and everything out there. And, and so you were hand bucking, you know, 95 pound bales up onto the wagons and everything and, and uh, baling hay out there in the hot sun. And if you ever want to know the definition of I am thirsty, so by noon, we'd go through that whole half gallon that was frozen, it was so hot outside, it would melt the whole thing down, it would be gone by the time noon rolled around. And so, uh, think about that, when you were thirsty and parched and, and really just uh, couldn't stand it, you had to have something to drink. Well, according to the Gospel writers, about the sixth hour that Jesus hung on the cross, he said, I am thirsty. Now, that sparked quite a bit of debate among a lot of the theologians on why he said what he said and what it might mean. So I figured, well, Webster, let's go see what they say about it. So Webster tells us being thirsty can mean several things. Number one, a sensation of dryness in the mouth and throat associated with the desire for liquids. Okay, we've all had that. We know what that's all about. Uh, Number two, the bodily condition as of dehydration, when we're really, really dehydrated, and it seems like we can never get enough fluid coming in, it causes us to have that sensation or a need for our body. It gives us a desire to want to drink. And that is a natural reaction as we expire the fluid from our bodies, then we need to replenish that in. If, if not, then we become dehydrated were lacking in fluid. So, and number three, which really throws the, the wrench into the works, finally, it's an ardent desire, a craving or a longing, when you thirst for something. You thirst for something. So I want you to hold on to all three of those definitions today as we hear the message. So as you can see, it, it means several different things. When we say we're thirsty, it could be pretty much anything. It could be a physiological desire to drink because we're dehydrated. It could be, hey, I've been out here bucking bales all morning long and I have to have some water because I'm dying out here. Or it could be a craving or a longing for something uh, that is an ardent desire. And an ardent desire is one that kind of takes over our whole conscious thought at that point in time and we really, really want it bad. Um, so physiologically, if we look at it, Jesus had bled quite a bit, and the body would be telling him that he needed to drink. And then uh, coming along with that, hanging out in the hot sun of the day, he would have been dehydrated as well from the lack of blood because he was bleeding out ever since he got flogged in the town square all the way up, up to Golgotha where he got hung on the cross. And if we think about it, he may have been longing for that point in time for a release from his earthly body so he could return to his Father in heaven, having fulfilled his Father's will. And that's that ardent desire, that, that craving, that longing for something. He wanted to be back home. He wanted to be back in heaven with his Father. So we have all three of these things are very plausible explanations of why he said that he was thirsty from the cross. Some theologians claim it was simply to fulfill scriptural prophecy out there. Uh, but actually, in your all of these things is really correct. So he met all of the conditions for being thirsty, according to Webster. So let's take a look at some of these things. 
Jesus, as he was, he was the fulfillment of the covenant of the Old Testament. His life, his ministry, his works that he was doing in his ministry here on earth is tied to the covenant people of the Old Testament, to God's new work in the church in the New Testament. Everything is tied together. So as we see, and, and we mentioned this many, many times before, last week I talked about the writings that were done a thousand years before Jesus was born. He fulfilled those prophecies to the absolute letter. And when we take a look at it, we, we look back at the, at the uh, writings in Isaiah that were done 670 years before he was born. He fulfilled those prophecies as well. So Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament and to begin a new covenant relationship between God and his people. Because we got that broken in the Garden of Eden, first thing, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, the covenant that God made with Adam at that point in time, Adam and Eve, hey, don't eat, you can have anything you want in here, just not that tree right there. And so that's what they do, they went and broke it. And so because of that sin then, uh, God then later on made a new covenant with his people that he would remain their God if they would remain faithful to him. Remember that one? Old Testament stuff? Okay, so big question is, did they remain faithful to him? No. Over and over and over. So the Old Testament is replete with all the things the people did wrong on how they were not being a godly people and how they kept separating themselves from God. So ever since that first fall in the Garden of Eden, God wanted to restore that relationship, and he, over and over and over and over again, he sent all kinds of stuff. So Jesus then was sent down to fulfill that Old Covenant Testament, that Old Covenant Covenant with the people, and to start a New Covenant with the people, start all over again. So the old is gone, the new is here. Whack that thing around sometimes. So, many people believe that Jesus referred to Jeremiah's message of the new covenant when he was talking about uh, what was coming when Jeremiah proclaimed what was coming in the future. So Jeremiah, when we take a look at that, verses 37b to 41, I will bring them back to this very city and let them live in peace and safety. They will be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one purpose to worship me forever for their own good and for the good of all of their descendants. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good for them. I will put a desire in their hearts to worship me and they will never leave me. So God had given this message to Jeremiah to give to the people. And if we remember, and Jeremiah, if you read the book of Jeremiah, you want to talk about a mess going on in the world. And, you know, he was his life was being threatened because of the messages that God was giving him. Because God was saying, I am going to strike you down and I am going to do this. Because you did everything that you could against my will. And everything that God had told him not to do through the prophets, through the messages, that's what the people did. Just, just like children, right? So you tell your kids not to do something, what do they do? They go out and do that exact thing you told them not to do. Uh, Lori says, I do that too, and she tells me not to do something. <laughs> I'm a kid at heart, what can I say? I may be old, but I'm a kid at heart. Yes, you are. So here is, here is Jeremiah telling them that God is saying, hey, I will start a new covenant with you. He is foretelling the new covenant that is going to be fulfilled in the life of Christ the new covenant with his people. And if you listen to it, uh, I will make an everlasting covenant. So this covenant is not going to go away, no matter what. So I'm going to make an everlasting covenant. I will never stop gooding, doing good for them. Now, in, irregardless of the bad that we do, God is still going to do good. This is a covenant. This is a promise. Uh, uh, 
and, and it's not a promise like we would give somebody else around here. This is a covenant that an unbreakable covenant that will last forever. I will never stop doing good for them. I will put a desire in their hearts to worship me. And they will never leave me. I will find joy doing good for them and, the, and will faithfully and wholeheartedly replant them in this land. So he was fulfilling that promise that he had given way back when to Abraham that they were going to bring him to a land flowing with milk and honey and that their people would be restored in that land. So Jesus brought the fulfillment of the promise of the new covenant of God, which God had promised through the prophet Isaiah, and the names of the two testaments of the Bible then get their names from those covenants. We have the Old Testament. It's a testimony to the covenant of God. The New Testament is, guess what? The testimony to the new covenant that Jesus uh, fulfilled. So in the life of Jesus, the grandest hope is of the old covenant and the brightest possibility of this new covenant came together. They joined themselves together. So that's why it is so special. And we have to understand that, you know, it wasn't everything with the old covenant stopped here. And now we have this whole new covenant. It's a whole bunch of different stuff. No, the two are completely interjoined, intertwined with each other. So the foretelling of what was to come in the new covenant of God that he was going to establish with his people was told ahead of time, much, much, much ahead of time, it's like 700 years, 1,000 years ahead of time. God gave it to the people in prophecy through the prophets that he had that, hey, I'm going to do this, return to me, and I will restore you. So Jesus is the restoration. It is the fulfillment of the covenant of restoration between God and his people that was broken all the way back in the Garden of Eden. So to fulfill what God had spoken through the prophets hundreds of years before, Jesus came. And he came for us. And this is important to understand as we witness Jesus on the cross, the reason that he is there and what it means for us. He just didn't come and, and oops, guess what? The people just said, crucify him, put him on a cross, and it's, it's done. There's a whole relationship that goes along with this. So this is a, a very relational life and story. So when our call to worship this morning... Uh, Pastor Terry read Mark 14, 35 and 36, where Jesus called out to God as he's praying in the garden. Uh, he is praying to God, and, and it is a earnest, and it is a heartfelt prayer. And he's pouring himself out. He's pouring himself out to God. Now, he calls God Father, and that, in Aramaic, is the most intimate term you can have for Father. And so he's, he's praying to God in, in, in the first person. Abba, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. And the cup of suffering that he was going to have to endure. He knew what he had to do. He knew what he had to do. And in referring to God as Abba, he is reaffirming his position then as the Son of God. Abba, Father. You don't, you don't call someone... Abba, in Aramaic, you don't call him Abba unless they are the father, your father. So he is calling out to his father in that relationship. So this is a very relational prayer that he is sharing. Through this, we have an understanding that prayer is an intimate, trusting relationship was shown in how Jesus then addressed his father. And though it may be kind of tough for us to struggle through this and grasp Jesus the Son agonized with the Father because he was here to fulfill the will of God. His whole life was to fulfill the will of God. The will of God was is that he would have to suffer and die on the cross to take on that sin, the one final, final sacrifice of his one and only Son so that the sins of all mankind would be cast upon Jesus the cup of bitter suffering and death. If it is your will, take this cup from me. None of us wants to die. But see, he was there and he was committed to doing the will of his Father. And so he had to endure that suffering. 
So through that, as I said, we have that understanding that prayer is an intimate, trusting relationship was shown through how Jesus then addressed him as Abba, Father. And so he is agonizing with the Father in this prayer. He's struggling from his human side to avoid that absolute maximum price that he was going to have to pay if possible. And yet, at the same time, he remained obedient to the will of God. He obeyed the will of God no matter what. It was going to cost him his life. And yet he obeyed the will of God. He was obedient to it. He was prepared to give himself totally to do God's will. He was all in, as we say nowadays. He was all in. He was committed. He was all in to do the will of God. He can he came then to fulfill the revealed will of the Father. His life was revealing the will of the Father. Everything he taught, everything he did. And so Jesus' entire life on earth was to fulfill the will of the Father. In John 6.38 he says to his disciples what his purpose was in coming down from heaven. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again on the last day. So what he is saying in here is, I am here and I am going to fulfill the, the will of the Father. He gave me life to fulfill here on earth, and I should lose, lose nothing but to raise it up again on the last day. He was raised up on the cross as a testimony to doing the will of God, full obedience to the will of God. So Jesus was here to do that will, and so there would be no doubt of who he was and why he came. During approximately the six hours that Jesus hung on the cross, Jesus spoke several final statements. One of those is recorded in John 19, uh, 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now, the scripture that links all this together goes all the way back to Psalms, the Psalms of David. And I'll get to that in a minute. But he was there to fulfill that scripture. The Apostle John links Jesus' statement, I thirst to the fulfillment of the scripture. There were, in fact, 20 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled during the 24-hour period surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus and his subsequent death on the cross. Not one or two. The odds of that happening and him fulfilling that many 20 Old Testament scriptures, the things that were written six, seven hundred years before, a thousand years before he was even born, he fulfilled within one day. One day. And so there would be no doubt whatsoever who he was and why he was there. The scriptures were fulfilled. By highlighting how Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled through Jesus' crucifixion, John showed that everything was happening according to God's plan, the will of God. So as you can see, God had this thing planned out so far ahead of time. He started back when that original sin happened. He started putting the plan together. Now we, we have a hard time figuring out what we're going to eat the next day for dinner or what we're going to have for lunch today, right? After the church service is over, I can hear it right now. What do you want to do for lunch? What do you want to do for lunch? We, we have a problem figuring that out, you know, half an hour ahead of time. But here's God. He put a plan together 2,000 years in advance. It's the fulfillment of what God had planned for us. His will for God's people. So when Jesus said, I thirst from the cross, he was alluding to the prophecy in Psalms 22:15. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. 
You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. The Apostle John had cited this same psalm earlier regarding the dividing of Jesus' garments among the, uh, among the Roman soldiers. If we turn back to John 19, 23. So here, here they are tying that together again. The Old Testament being tied together with the New Covenant. The new covenant in Jesus alive for us. In response to Jesus' request for something to drink, the soldiers at that time offered him wine vinegar. And the scripture says that a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and they lifted it up to Jesus' lips. Now, wine vinegar was the absolute cheapest and easiest for the soldiers to acquire. Now, if you're thinking about it, we're, we're thinking about vinegar, like you're going to take the apple cider vinegar or those kind of things, or wine vinegar. Um, when it starts to turn, then they would sell it off for cheap before it turned completely into the vinegar that we're used to. Although some of the vinegars are pretty decent if you like balsamic vinegar and things like that. It's got a really good flavor to it. I digress. <laughs> So the Roman soldiers then lifted up this vinegar, the easiest and cheapest wine for the soldiers to acquire to Jesus to offer him to wet his lips. Earlier, Jesus refused to drink of vinegar mixed with gall or myrrh. And gall uh, is a very bitter substance that has got medicinal properties. It, it is a pain reliever. So it, it knocks down the body's uh, ability to uh, take on pain and myrrh does the same things they weren't sure exactly what was mixed with the vinegar but he refused that offering that they were giving him at that point in time to relieve him of his suffering and we find that in Matthew and in Mark's Gospels as well and then after that the soldiers mockingly offered him wine vinegar but didn't allow him to drink they were teasing him further taunting him at that point in time Luke tells us about that in 2336. So we get through all of that, that Jesus had endured and all the rest of the taunting that came along with it. But here, several hours later, Jesus states, I am thirsty. Thus asking for something to drink. Or was he just longing at that point in time? Think about hanging on the cross, fighting for every breath, for each breath. He had to push up with his feet to take the, the weight off of his chest because his arms were stretched out and the whole weight of his body hung on his chest. So to breathe, he had to push up on the legs that were nailed to the cross. Excruciating pain. Thus the crucifixion. Excruciating is the term for the pain that he'd have to suffer. So each breath was excruciating painful. They died of suffocation, typically from the cross. At that same time, because of the problem, the alveoli inside the lungs, the little sacs that transfer the oxygen into your bloodstream, that's where it comes from. It's called alveoli. There's literally billions of alveoli inside your lungs. And so at that point in time, they fill up with fluid. You ever hear of pneumonia? Your lungs start to fill up with fluid. It's the alveoli sacs that are bursting open. So fluid is filling his lungs at the same time. So again, he is thirsting because he is literally suffocating on the cross. So this time then, when Jesus says, I am thirsty and asks for a drink, this time the soldiers actually give him some. And this action was a fulfillment of yet another scripture. In Psalm 69, 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Understand, that was written 1,100 years before he was born. But moreover, it marked that he had poured himself out fully to the fulfillment of the will of his Father. And I want you to understand that at that point in time. He had given his all. He had poured himself out, literally, by the blood, he had poured himself out. 
He drank the bitter cup of suffering and death to wash away the sins of all mankind. And in doing so, he was empty. He was emptied of any more energy, of any more that he could give. He had, he's giving it all. He was empty. He was thirsty. He was finished. The cup of suffering was the payment for the sins of all, even the ones who nailed him to the cross. Because what did he just get done saying before this? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was fully human, yet fully divine, and out of pure love, agape love, a love that has no strings attached. It is freely and openly given by another. Agape love. One that is never ending. There is no ending to that type of love. He suffered and died, which alludes to what he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we heard in Mark 14 in our call to worship, when he prayed that that cup of suffering, that cup may be taken from him. And in his humanness, he did not want to suffer and die, but then he goes on to say, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but yours, Father, I have to fulfill why you sent me here to begin with. Can you empathize with what he was praying? What he was going through? Have you ever prayed that the cup of suffering that you were going through would be removed from you? Yeah. So we know exactly what he was talking about here. We know exactly emotionally what he was feeling. From the very pit of his being, he was saying, hey, I don't want to die. But at the same time, he was saying, I know that I have to do this to fulfill your will, God. He was obedient regardless of the consequence. Most of us are disobedient because of consequence. The act of the consequence usually brings us back into so I prayed that prayer many times. So I've got a question for you. How did God answer you? How did God answer you? Now obviously I'm not talking about you having to die for others. But in the midst of suffering, when everything seems hopeless, you pray to God and hope he hears you. You hope he answers you. You hope he gives you a way out of what you're going through. You want to be released from that cup of suffering that you're going through. And see, the key to all of this is, is that prayer restores hope to that hopeless situation. We fall on our knees to God. We humble ourselves down before him. Because we're not worthy to be in his presence. And we say, God, if, if it's your will, take this cup from me. And Jesus was praying so hard. He, his sweat was coming off like drops of blood. He was literally sweating blood. He was praying that so fervently. Now I want you to think about it right now. That situation that you were in, where you said, God, if you can take this cup of suffering for me, please do. Do you hear me, God? Will you answer me, God? Are you still there? Are you still there? Are you still there in that situation? Or did God answer your prayer and bring you through it? I think by all of us sitting here right now, we know that for the most part, that cup of suffering is probably past. We might have some remnants left over, got some pains going on, but he's brought us through it. He didn't keep us from it because we grow from the situation. We grow and we learn from that situation. But moreover, what happens is, is by going to God and turning it over to him, we strengthen our relationship with God when we submit ourselves fully to God like Jesus did. When Jesus prayed, he connected to his Father and his will. And I think, see, we do that as well. Prayer brings us closer to God every time we pray. It restores 
that relationship. When we pray and listen, and listen for what God is saying, we come closer to doing the will of our Father, to doing the will of God. See, God was really good. He, he knew what it was all about. He gave us one mouth and two ears. So we're supposed to listen twice as hard as what we're supposed to use this guy for. The problem is we usually <coughs> use this guy more than we use deeds. So what I'm saying here is God wants us to have a relationship with him that all begins with prayer. And as our prayer life expands, our relationship deepens, and the advocate then that he sends to us to advocate on our behalf is the Holy Spirit. And then by us embracing the Holy Spirit and by embracing that relationship with God, we are blessed with what are called the fruits of the Spirit. And he begins to change us from the person that we are to the person he wants us to be. Fulfilling the will of God for us, his plan for our lives. Wow. You ever connect the dots on that one? It's kind of fun. See, then we become to the point to where we are relying on the leading of the Holy Spirit, his guidance as God reveal, reveals his will for us through his spirit. And that is the covenant relationship that Jeremiah foretold of God's desire for that covenant relationship. See all this ties together? Nothing's done by happenstance or mistake. It's kind of cool this way. So Jeremiah 32 again tells us, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them through the Holy Spirit living within us and dwelling within us. As our relationship grows, guess what? Our reliance on the Holy Spirit grows as well. And the gifts that God blesses us with grow as well. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will never stop doing good for them. See, Jesus was the embodiment of that covenant and the Holy Spirit is the advocate of God's will dwelling within us. Once we, once we enter into that covenant relationship with God, that's what's meant by that covenant relationship. When we turn our will towards God's will. And that's a tough thing for us to do because how are we raised? We are raised to be independent, be all you can be. Do it on your own. Be independent. Lori and I, we raised our youngest son to be very independent. Boy, I'll tell you what, he's independent. We want to hear from him, we got to call him. But anyway, Jesus talks several times about being living water and that we would never thirst again. If you think back to the woman at the well, he was, he was asking her for a drink of water. He was physically, physiologically thirsty. And so she gives him every reason why she can't give him water. Because she's Samaritan. But the will came from Abraham. And he said, woman, if you knew of the water that I would give you, you would thirst no more. Because I give you a living water that you will never thirst again. He was talking about the Holy Spirit then being poured out upon us that living water, the Spirit of God, the will of God living within us. In John 7, 38 and 39, John tells us, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be giving to everyone believing in him, the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. See, that Spirit, that living water, means we are refreshed by God's presence within us. That living water that never ends. Thirsty, dehydrated. When we are at our lowest, when we think, God, 
is far from us. See, at that point in time, we are spiritually thirsty. We're dehydrated. We need that living water. How can we get it? We have to seek God first to give us that spiritual water to quench our thirst. That's when we need to, to seek the presence of God is when we are spiritually thirsty, when we're dry. And then we have our thirst quenched again. And it all begins with prayer because we have to go and submit our will to God and he will quench our spiritual thirst. It begins with being in the presence of other believers. It comes from intercessory prayer that we do here. We pray on behalf of others and that brings us that spiritual fulfillment. As we pray for someone else that's down in the dumps who's going through the troubles in their life, see, we're praying that they might be blessed. And at the same time, we are being blessed for praying for them because we are doing the will of God. We are here to edify each other, to lift each other up in communion with each other as part of the body of Christ. Wednesday night, I talked about that. I talked about being the body of Christ. This is what it means for us to be joined together in a common cause to uplift the will of God and to get the blessings that God has from us. When others are praying for our needs, we get a blessing, they get blessed as well. Or when we're praying for the needs of others, they get blessed, we get blessed as well. See, these are all God's waters flowing from his throne. People in concert with one another for the betterment of the kingdom, of the church, the body of believers, you and I. All of us here in this room. We're not blood relations, but we are related through the body of Christ. The body of Christ. So I'm going to leave you with this. Are you thirsting for living waters? Are you thirsting for living waters? I want you to think about it. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you today with the humbleness of heart. We've all messed up and fallen short of the glory of God, but you assure us that's not where we have to stay. Lost in a lost world. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for your unending love, that agape love that is given freely and openly. We thank you for your forgiveness. Help us to be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us to your glory. So today we ask that you would restore us, that you would reconcile us to you, that you would redeem us today, Lord Jesus. We pray in your holy name that you would give us those living waters so that we can pass those waters onto others and bless them as you have blessed us. Lord God, we, we ask that you would keep us ever mindful. Open our eyes to see the wonders in your glory. Open our ears to hear you calling our name. Calling us back into righteous relationship with you. Calling us to fulfill your will and not our own. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a good God, a faithful God that your glory reigns forever and ever in our hearts as well. Amen. <clears throat> as you mentioned, I am thirsty, and then you talked about the woman at the well. Jesus can only have been thirsty because of his humanness. Because as God, there's no thirst. And that's what he told the woman at the well. As we take communion today, meditate on the words that you heard this morning.
things that happened at the cross. Of all the things we learned in his ministry, the things that he speaks of the cross can just encompass so much more in how we can live our lives. That night that he was betrayed, before all of this happened, he would take bread and break it with his disciples, knowing that Judas was right there amongst them. Judas was going to betray him and start this whole series of events happening that evening. But he broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And then a little bit later in the meal, he takes the cup. And after filling it, he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many take and drink. Scripture tells us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink this cup, we are to do so until Christ's return. And many of us would love for that to be now, but there's still someone out there who has not accepted him as his Lord and Savior. And so God, being the patient God that he is, is waiting for that to happen. So until that time, we will continue to come together. We will continue to learn, sharpen each other, as the scripture says, sharp, iron sharpens iron. And we will continue to celebrate this meal, this communion. The body of Christ broken for you. Take it. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take it. Heavenly Father, this meal represents so very much more than just a tradition or a ritual. It's about a reminder of what your Son did for us. The things that we have been talking about for the last several weeks, his final moments on the cross. This sacrifice that he said, not my will, but yours. So, Father, as we go through life, let it not be about our will, but your will, Father. And, Father, there are those out there that are thirsty. They're longing for something. They are trying to fill a hole in the heart with so many different things. A hole that only you can fill, Father. So when we say, we are thirsty, fill our cup, Lord. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit to get us through this time that we have left here on this earth so that when the time comes and our end comes to be here that we will come to you embrace and hear the words well done, good and faithful servant in Jesus name here this morning. So again, it's time for prayers for the people, and um, I'm going to add my grandson, Colt. He uh, was practicing in uh, track last Thursday and tore his kneecap yeah. away from the knee, so yeah, so he's going to be in a little pain for a while and healing, so we'll pray for him. Is there anybody else that would like prayer this week? Yes. Um, hi, roommate Tina here. Yes. I uh, just found out she had diabetes, mm -hmm. so I just want um, God to let her know that he loves her yes. as far as the east is from the west mm -hmm. and um, also my uh, birthday is coming up in five days and I just pray that uh, oh. my parents will be able to get a hold of me because I haven't been a hold of them for like the past ten years so, oh my gosh. so I, I pray just pray that, that they that I can get a hold of them oh, so happy birthday thank you so much pray for that. okay anybody else Let's pray for each other. Father God, we come to you this morning with all kinds of prayer requests. We lift up praise to you, and we thank you for life and breath each new day. We thank you that you are Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the Prince of Peace. 
We give all honor to you, for in 1 Peter 3.18, it states, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous and for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Therefore, we have confidence that your Holy Spirit lives in us, and we are to come to you, Father, with all kinds of prayers and requests. For we know that you are alive and sitting at the right hand of God, and you will intercede for us. Father, we realize the world is your stage, and the nations are yours to command. You will bring each nation into submission by your mighty hand. Yours will be the glory. In Psalms 99, 2 and 3, Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. You are holy. You do say that we should pray with all kinds of requests. Therefore, I ask that there be a ceasefire for all nations during this Easter season. Please place on the hearts of men to release all persons being held by Hamas. We pray that they are we pray that they are still alive and have strength and courage that you provide them to sustain them during this horrific trial they are facing. Be with them and bring them home to their loved ones, Father God. We ask this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Father, we lift up the family of Wendy Sundberg as she came home to you last week, and we ask for continued comfort and peace that passes all understanding to be upon this family at this time of sorrow. And Father God, we continue to ask for healing for Don's dizziness. We rebuke the Munir disease in Jesus' name. We claim the blood of Jesus, wash over him and sustain him each and every day. Keep his mind steady in Jesus' name. We lift up Amanda and Kelly to you, Father, for their kidney diseases. We ask that you walk with them and sustain them with this trial they are facing. Let them be conquerors in Christ Jesus. And Father, we lift up <coughs> Tina and her diabetes. We just praise you for Tina, Father God, and we just ask that you help her through this trial, Lord God. Help her to make the right decisions for her body and to um, administer the correct medicine that she needs to sustain her. And Father, we lift up Alex um, for his birthday this week. We just ask that you reach out to his father and his mother. Bring them back into a relationship with Alex, Lord Jesus. It's time to heal wounds, Father God. And we just pray this, that they will, they will find him or he will find them and they will accept him as you accept each one of us, Father God. We praise you. And thank you, Father, for our children and grandchildren. Give them courage to face each day and guide them onto the path of righteousness. I pray also for my grandson, Dylan, who's on his way here from Texas today. I pray that the um, flight will not be um, delayed, and I pray wisdom for the pilots and uh, co-pilots, Lord Jesus, to get all these people here safely, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for the homeless people, and we thank you that you do sustain them through their trials. Thank you for the food and shelter and jobs that you provide them. Oh, Father, I ask for continued healing for Colt, Colt's knee, for Mark's knee, and Joe's knee, and myself, that you walk with us daily. Help us to be ever mindful that you are guiding us from strength to strength. Help all who suffer to remember 1 Peter 4, 12, 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. To God be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> come to our end of our online portion of our service today uh, Terry has put up the link for our music and uh, uh, I, I think I went through at least 15 songs trying to pick the ones that we could hear today uh, so I I waited to see which one shouted out the loudest and that's, that's what I went in for us today so hopefully you can be blessed through the music as well as the message today so 
Uh, gracious Lord, we need you in our lives so much each and every day. We come before you today and we confess that we are sinners. We are in need of your grace and your mercy. We repent of our sins today and we pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus, that we can be redeemed, that we can be made whole with you again. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven and that your spirit would guide us and give us the strength that we need to overcome the world today. We look for your hope and your love that we might be your disciples in this lost world and that we could spread that hope and love to those who direly need it. Lord, we lift up our lives today to you, our church, our city, our state, and our nation, and indeed the entire world to you. You have enough love, Lord God, that you can surround this whole earth with your love. We ask today that you would open up the ears of those people who need to hear your love and your message today to bring them into right relationship and reconciliation with you so that we could put an end to the war and the suffering. We ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world and that your word and your name would be boldly proclaimed and that your works would be done. So Lord, we pray today that you would embolden us to step up and step out, to bring home the lost, to lead us to growth in your spirit and help us and keep us focused on you and keep us in your spirit each and every day. In your precious name we pray.